We continue uh, our messages uh, about some very important yet controversial doctrines of the Bible. And tonight we're going to talk about alcohol. Uh, there is a debate in the Christian world uh, right now about alcohol consumption, or oh, well, wine, beer, you name it, in moderation, in moderation. And let me start by saying that in biblical terms, it is very hard to distinguish in the Bible the words for alcoholic and non-alcoholic fruit of the vine. In the New Testament, it's oinos, the old is yainen. They have quite a few terms used in the Bible. And they didn't distinguish at that time between wine, fermented fruit of the vine, and unfermented fruit of the vine. They use the same word. Obviously, there is and there should be a distinction between uh, the Old and the New Testament. But I want to be as biblical as I can and convince you of total abstinence when it comes to alcoholic beverages. This is a matter of principle. I will use a lot of Bible verses, so um, I would appeal to whoever is between those screens there, sharp, okay? All right. Now, the general sense and spirit of the word of God is negative towards alcoholic beverages. When you read all the verses in the Bible mentioning alcohol, it has a negative connotation. When you read about people drinking they don't end up too well. Remember Noah? Remember Lot? And uh, quite a few others. And when we are talking about holy men falling into this, it shows that you cannot trust human nature with wine, with alcohol. Let me give you a few verses that give us a general sense and spirit of the word of God when it comes to alcohol. First Peter chapter 4, verse 3. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 3. For you have spent enough time in the past doing what pagans choose to do, living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and detestable idolatry. Romans 13, 13. Romans 13, 13. Let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Galatians 5, from verse 19 to 21. Galatians 5, 19. The acts of the flesh are obvious, sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery, 
idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now let me pause a little because we see a trend here. Drunkenness associated with all these terrible sins. And let me tell you this. When you get drunk and it's easy to go past your limit of tolerance. This is how people become drunks. They get addicted. You're doing all the other things. Drunkenness has something to do with all the other things. I remember a story, it's just a story, maybe a, a fable. It says that Satan went to a man and said, I give you three choices. You got a sin today. Whatever uh, you're going to choose, but you have to choose one of three. You go and beat your mother, or kill your father, or get drunk. So the guy said, you know what? I'm not going to beat up my mother. I love her. I ain't going to kill my father. But uh, getting drunk ain't going to hurt anybody. So he went and got drunk, went home. His mother reproached him. He hit her. His father jumped to her help and he killed him. Now again, I really hope that um, this never happened, yet I think we might have quite a few cases of abuse like that caused by drunkenness. Ephesians 5.18, do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. See? They are tied together. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. In the Romanian translation, it says, be filled with the Spirit, don't be filled with wine. They exclude each other. You're either going to be filled with the Spirit or you're going to be filled with wine and sin. And uh, let me tell you something else about that. Do you remember in the Old Testament when there was a special man called by God that wine and alcoholic beverages were prohibited? Not only by the man, but by the mother. In uh, the book of Judges, chapter 13, when it comes to uh, the story of Samson, the, angels, the angel of the Lord came to his mother and said, thou shalt have a son, but you have to abstain, completely abstain, from many things included strong drinks and wine. Because this son of yours is called to a special ministry, it's going to be covered by the Spirit of God, and he will be led by the Spirit of God to be a deliverer of the people of Israel. Now I know um, in Ecclesiastes 9-7, and uh, I, I caught on to it that some young people send each other this uh, verse from the Bible. Be careful when they send you a verse out of context when, and, and against the 
main spirit, the main direction of the word of God. It says, go eat your food with gladness and drink your wine with a joyful heart. For God has already approved what you do. Now be very careful when you read from Ecclesiastes and the books of wisdom because some of them are just sarcastic. Do you remember another verse from Ecclesiastes? How about chapter 11 verse 9? Oh, you would love that, young people. You who are young, be happy while you are young. And let your heart give you joy in the days of your youth. Follow the ways of your heart and whatever your eyes see. But know that for all these things, God will bring you into judgment. So... Um, when you were built up, oh, I can do whatever I want. I can set my eyes on whatever. It's kind of demolishing. The first parts of that verse, when it says, be aware. For everything you do, you're going to be called into judgment. So since we are in the books of wisdom, let's see what Proverbs 20 verse 1 says. Wine is a mucker and beer a brawler. Whoever is led astray by them is not wise. And if you are not wise, you are a fool. How about Proverbs 23, 31? Do not gaze at wine when it is red, when it sparkles in the cup, when it goes down smoothly. Don't even look at it. What about Proverbs 31, verses 4 and 5? Yeah, it bites afterwards. That's what the Bible says. It is not for kings, Lemuel. It is not for kings to drink wine. Not for rulers to crave beer. Now, we know the teachings of the kingdom. And up to a point, I agree with them. We are sons of God. And we have to be godly. We don't have the authority of God. We are not anointing buildings and take over the world. That's for Christ and the church during the millennial kingdom. But our bodies are the temples of the spirit. And we are kings. And if we are, the Bible says, that's not for you, lest they drink and forget what has been decreed and deprive all the oppressed of their rights. See, when you're drunk, and now let's apply it to us as children of God, we're going to forget the rules, the commandments, the principles. And we're not going to behave appropriately to the people around us. So, uh, drinking uh, becomes also a part of general theology, general principles in theology. Let's read 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 23 and 24. I have the right to do anything because this is what a lot of people, I mean, Paul is quoting the freedom theology. We're free of the law. We can do whatever we want. Well, okay. I have the right to do anything you say. It's, <laughs> Paul doesn't say it. I don't say it. You say it. But not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but not everything is constructive. Let me ask you this. If it's not constructive, what is it? Destructive. Because things are either constructive or 
destructive. Let's read from uh, Romans chapter 14, verses 15 to 21. And uh, this applies to the way we ought to behave and be a light for other people. See, a lot of converts in the church come from the world, and some of them were delivered by God from a life of drunkenness. So another reason why we should totally abstain, Romans 14, 15. If your brother or sister is distressed because of what you eat, you are no longer acting in love. Do not by your eating destroy someone for whom Christ died. Therefore, do not let what you know is good be spoken of as evil. And it, I understand it talks about rules about what you should eat, what you should not eat according to the law, and you should not be a stumbling block for others. But look at this. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Because anyone who serves Christ in this way is pleasing to God and receives human approval. Let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and to mutual edification. We have a wonderful meal with the church and let's say we believe in drinking wine in moderation and the former drunk is sitting at the table and sees the glass of wine trust me he's not looking at the glass he's looking at the bottle Do not destroy the work of God, the conversion, the deliverance of God in somebody else's life. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All food is clean, but it is wrong for a person to eat anything that causes someone else to stumble. It is better not to eat meat or drink wine or to do anything else that will cause your brother or sister to fall. So listen, even in those respects, with those foods and drinks, there would not be considered a sin. And even if I cannot convince you tonight, because I know some of you will look at me and I can speak for two hours here about this, and I can give you a hundred verses, and at the end of the day, if you like it, you're not going to accept it. And you're going to say, I, he, he didn't convince me. Yeah, but what about this and what about that and what about the other? Okay, forget about this argument. Let's assume absurdly that wine would not be a sin, but it is a stumbling block for somebody who can fall back into the addiction. Out of love, for that person, I will never put a drop of wine in my mouth. Yeah, we had to get to this. First Timothy 5.23, First Timothy 5.23. And um, now, uh, uh, by the way, with uh, being sick at the stomach, I know a lot of people have stomach problems. Uh, you want to drink wine? Get sick. But, but it's, there's no pleasure. Listen to this. Paul is saying to Timothy, stop drinking only water. And use a little wine because of your stomach and your frequent illnesses. Now, let's stop for a moment. Why is Paul giving Timothy this advice if in the primary church 
wine was not a sin and they could drink in, in moderation because this is a little wine. That's moderation. You know why Paul gives Timothy publicly this advice? Because Timothy and the church would not use any wine in any quantity. If it was common to use it, there was no need for this disclaimer. Oh, well, you, you, you can use a little. Secondly, the problem is the water might have been contaminated and contributed to the frequent illnesses. A lot of people got sick in the old because of the water they drank. Paul doesn't say here, drink water and sometimes drink wine. No. Intermittently. No. It says, don't put water only in your glass. Put a few drops of wine in the water so it disinfects it. But that was completely tasteless and it had absolutely no entertainment value to Timothy. It was a medical advice that Paul gave to him. And the church had to know that when Timothy is drinking water, is putting a few drops of wine, not only water, but a little bit, add a little bit of wine, because if he ate, drank the water and it was contaminated, without a few drops of wine, then it didn't matter that later on he drank a glass of wine, he would have gotten sick because the water was not disinfected. The purpose of adding a few drops of wine was to disinfect the water, not to entertain Timothy. So, don't use that as an excuse. You might curse yourself with some kind of belly sickness. If you use that as an example. And I don't want you to get sick. Now, of course, we cannot avoid John chapter 2, verses 3 to 11. And I'm not going to read them all, but I remind you, it is about Jesus uh, transforming water into wine. I 100% believe that was not alcoholic wine. And I'll tell you two reasons. First of all, the reason they served the better wine in the beginning and the lesser wine as time passed, because people would get drunk at weddings, was because in the beginning their taste buds were working fine. At some point when you get drunk, and trust me, I don't speak from experience, I have absolutely no idea, I had to read about it, and I documented myself, but that's the truth. After a while, you don't have a lot of tasting left in your mouth. So, when the wine was given to the manager of the wedding and to the people, he came to complain. And he said, you got it all wrong. How come you brought the better wine at the end, the better tasting wine at the end, and you put the lesser wine in the beginning? Now, a few things. First, the wine that Jesus gave to them were, was better than the wine they had, and I assume uh, it was the best wine available at that time, so it must have been different. Secondly, 
As I have said, I don't and I didn't experiment with wine. Um, I, I, you, you are going to forgive me tonight, but I have to say that I have to, to put a parenthesis here because I am going back to the parents and how you are parenting. Do you know that the Holy Spirit can help you parent your children? I'm going to tell you a true story. How I have never smoked, but I'll tell you how close I came to smoking when I was six years old. We used to live in a uh, block of flats apartment building on the sixth floor. And in the back of the building, I was playing, I was six. And the guy walking on the street threw a cigarette butt on the sidewalk and it was still fuming. It had a little life in it. So I was six and I was curious. So at first I looked at it. Secondly, I said, where are these people smoking? Must be something smelling good. So I got closer. I went in the way of the smoke. It didn't feel too good, so it must be something they taste. So as I was looking at that cigarette butt, and this is the truth, my mother was cooking in the kitchen, and she heard the voice of the Holy Spirit. Go look down the window now. So she left everything on the table, went to the window, looked down. She saw me looking down, and she saw the smoke coming out of that cigarette butt. So the rest is uh, very unpleasant history. She immediately screamed. I got electrocuted by that scream. She called me upstairs. And uh, the lesser punishment of them all that I got that day was a month in my room and go outside to play for a month and I just looked at it trust me uh, I never looked at anything like that ever again uh, and uh, but ask the Holy Spirit to help you parent your children Ask the Holy Spirit to tell you when your children might be in a bad entourage and they might try on alcoholic beverage because once they're hooked and addicted, it's tough. It will be tough. It will be tough. So Jesus gave them the better wine. It woke them up. Because now they're talking amongst each other and say, isn't this better? I mean, the manager can even walk to the groom and say, I, I assume the manager would taste a lot of wine on these occasions. So he can walk to the groom and say, what happened? But I will tell you this, I believe in God, I trust God, and I trust Jesus, that he will never, ever go against his principles and the general sense and direction and spirit of what the Bible says. He didn't come to break the rules, but to fulfill them. And being the Son of God, and especially chosen by God, and filled with the Holy Spirit Himself. Not only from the womb of His mother, but from eternity 
eternity because he came from the Holy Spirit to be born. Whatever was imposed to the mothers and to the especially elected people in the old would have applied to Jesus. So don't you dare tell me that Jesus drank alcohol. Don't you dare tell me that Jesus gave other people alcohol to drink. If you believe that, you don't know God, you don't know Jesus, and you don't know the Bible. And I'm going to end with something interesting. I'm going to read Jeremiah 35. Give me the whole, uh, the, from verse um, 1. I might read the whole thing, we'll see. This is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord during the reign of Jehoiakim, son of Josiah, king of Judah. Go to the Rechabite family and invite them to come to one of the side rooms of the house of the Lord and give them wine to drink. So I went to get uh, Jezaniah, son of Jeremiah, the son of Habazaniah, and his brothers and all his sons, the whole family of the Rechabites. I brought them into the house of the Lord, into the room of the sons of Hannah, son of Igdalia, the man of God. It was next to the room of the officials, which was over that of Maaseah, son of Shalom, the doorkeeper. Then I set bowls full of wine and some cups before the Rechabites and said to them, drink some wine. But they replied, we do not drink wine because our forefather, Jehonadab, son of Rechab, gave us this command. Neither you nor your descendants must ever drink wine. Also, you must never build houses, sow seed, or plant vineyards. You must never have any of these things, but must always live in tents. Then you will live a long time in the land where you are nomads. We have obeyed everything our forefather Jehonadab, son of Rechab, commanded us. Neither we, nor our wives, nor our sons and daughters have ever drunk wine or built houses to live in, or have vineyards, fields, or crops. We have lived in tents and have fully obeyed everything our forefather Jehonadab commanded us. But when Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, invaded this land, we said, come, we must go to Jerusalem to escape the Babylonian and Armenian armies. So we have remained in Jerusalem. Then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, saying, This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Go and tell the people of Judah and those living in Jerusalem, Will you not learn a lesson and obey my words? Declares the Lord. Jehonadab, son of Rechab, ordered his descendants not to drink wine, and this command has been kept to this day. They do not drink wine because they obey their forefathers' command. But I have spoken to you again and again, yet you have not obeyed me. Again and again, I sent all my servants, the prophets, to you. They said, each of you must turn from your wicked ways and reform your actions. Do not follow other gods to serve them. Then you will live in the land I have given you and your ancestors. 
but you have not paid attention or listened to me. The descendants of Jehonadab, son of Rechab, have carried out the command their forefather gave them, but these people have not obeyed me. Therefore, this is what the Lord God Almighty, the God of Israel says, listen, I am going to bring on Judah and on everyone living in Jerusalem every disaster I pronounced against them. I spoke to them, but they did not listen. I called to them, but they did not answer. Then Jeremiah said to the family of the Rechabites, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says, you have obeyed the command of your forefather Jehonadab and have followed all his instructions and have done everything he ordered. Therefore, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says, Jehonadab, son of Rechab, will never fail to have a descendant to serve me. At Alim Church, we preach and we demand full abstinence from any alcohol. That means no drop of alcohol. I heard once about a person that said to other young people, the only reason I stay in this church is because I want to convince young people that what this pastor preaches from the pulpit is not true. The doctrine in this church is not established at the restaurants, pizza places, houses of gathering where you go and talk amongst each other. The doctrine of this church is not established in the hallways, not in your houses. The doctrine of Elim Church is established from this pulpit. We are not asking you not to build houses, even though the sons of Rechab obeyed even that. They were not agriculturals. They didn't have any properties. They live in tents. And they never drank wine. But the lesson here is obeying the people in authority. And in that instance, it was their forefather. So now let's see what Matthew 18, 18 says for those that want to be disobedient. Truly I tell you, and it says it to the disciples, that means to the authority of the church. Truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven, uh, providing that it is not against the commandments of God. We have situations in the lives of people where we have to give them a path for survival, for continuing with their lives after traumatic instances. So it, on a case-by-case case situation, we might loosen and free a person. But whatever we bind is bound in heaven. And um, after all this explanation, we are saying that at the Lim Church we do not drink alcohol, not even in moderation, and also, if we don't drink it in moderation, there is absolutely no reason to drink non-alcoholic beer, 
politics I heard as a trend. Don't be a stumbling block and don't let yourself be seen by other people. So they're not going to know if it's alcoholic or non-alcoholic. And as I've said, first of all, it's because it's addictive and it leads to abuse and excess. It never stops. It's because we don't want to be a stumbling block to others. It's because of the general sense of the Bible. And it is because we are set aside for the Lord and we are kings in the kingdom of God. And we are filled with the Holy Spirit and a drop of wine will empty your life of the Holy Spirit because they cannot coexist. It says... Don't be filled with one, rather be filled with the Spirit. They cannot coexist. They're antagonistic. And in the end, for those that don't want to understand, Paul said, let them not understand. But you still have to obey because it's the authority of the church, the leadership of this church, the servants of this church. Believe and command that no alcohol in any quantity might be consumed by any of our members and because we're talking to parents how about you not be a stumbling block for your kids because if they see you drinking alcohol at some point they're gonna drink alcohol and when they do they might become addicted and you are going to look at the wreck of their lives and be sorry forever.